Hello and welcome to Real Menopause Talk. My guest today is Dr. Shazadi Harper. Feeling lacklustre, a low sex drive and having lost a sense of self are symptoms Dr. Harper sees every day. But, she asks, why should women lose their sparkle? Erectile dysfunction gets enough attention, but menopause affects every single woman. Dr. Harper is a passionate advocate for women's health. And in this episode, we hear her own experience of perimenopause, why and how she set up her clinic, and it's probably not how you expected, and her vital ingredients for rebuilding confidence and how to feel lighter and brighter. Dr. Shazadi Harper, lovely to meet you. Thank you for joining me today. Would you like to start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, so hi, um, I'm Dr. Shazadi Harper and I am um, sort of a menopause and perimenopause doctor. Um, I've been a GP um, in the NHS for sort of 20 odd years and I was approaching this stage in life myself and I thought there didn't seem to be much information out there. And when women sort of over the age of 40 used to come into my clinic, you know, into my GP surgery, I'd be thinking, well, what's going on? You know, what's going on with them coming in with all of these numerous sort of problems? And also they seem to kind of age overnight almost. So, so you know, my mother has dementia and I feel it was sort of accelerated around this age. I've got five younger sisters, so I always knew I'd be the one going through it first and be picked on, you know, because of it. And so I thought, you know, I really need to sort of find out more and you know, from my perspective, being a GP wasn't my sort of passion in life. I had my daughter sort of a year or so after I graduated. So um, I was a single mum. And then, you know, you, 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 as women do, we fit our lives, you know, we fit things around, you know, sort of our life. And so being a GP fitted in really well with being a, a single mum. So, but there was always this passion inside me that I wanted to be good at something, you know, just um, I'd wanted to be an endocrinologist. And I think that this coming along sort of allowed me to sort of nurture that need. And so I thought I really would like to be the best at what I do. And, and I sort of went away to kind of find out as much as possible. I'm also very much about equality. And I just felt that women's health just didn't get that same kind of um, you know, sort of attention that men do, do you, know, you know, erectile dysfunction, you know, for the last 20 years, we've been talking about it, you know, menopause affects every single woman. And, you know, we're just meant to sort of power through it. You know, one of the things we, with there being so many symptoms, you know, I think we needed to change the narrative around this sort of moody, hot, flushy woman. And for me, you know, my personally, my symptoms, when they started, were things like, my memory, and I've always been really good. You know, my memory's been always really good to the point that sometimes I freak people out. Like I've met them, you know, X time ago and I meet them again and I say, oh yes, blah, blah, blah. And they sort of think, is she a stalker? Which I'm not. So, you know, I had to train myself not to do that. So, you know, to find that my memory wasn't, you know, as sharp. And um, I, I remember losing things and my daughter saying, but mum, you don't lose things. And, and, and for me to sort of going around in circles thinking, well, where is this? Where is that? And with my mother having dementia, it kind of frightened me. Is this the route that I'm going down? Also, I was getting a lot of joint pains and anxiety. I, I'm the big sister. You know, I'm the one that sorts everybody else out. I'm not the one that sort of gets these sort of irrational sort of anxieties. I mean, I've always had really bad PMT. So I know what it feels like to feel out of control with your hormones. And the world doesn't really get to see that, Shazadi, because I tend to kind of lock myself away and just do what I need to do. And so even my um, sisters didn't even know what, how bad my PMT is unless they've come along at that point and I've you know, blown up in that rage, that red mist. And, and so there were lots of factors, you know, from, from, from a general point of view, you know, population of women point of view, but, but from a personal point of view, if you want me to sort of say to you selfishly, what was my drive? You know, there was part of me thinking, I don't want to get dementia, you know, um, you know, I wanted, I, I was also, like I said, um, you know, on my own. So I needed to maintain my financial status, you know, to keep working. I couldn't give up work. You know, I have no trust fund. So so I needed to be able to, to work. I was also single and I thought I still want to mingle, you know, in the sense of I don't want to suddenly feel that I've aged overnight or lost my sparkle. And why should women have to lose their sparkle? So 
So there were lots of factors around me doing what I do. Um, and, you know, like I said, very much at the forefront of it was that equality aspect. We as women should have equal choices, you know, equal rights, you know, be able to decide if we don't want to work or decide if we we want to do this rather than being forced into that scenario because our hormones made it, um, you know, sort of untenable for us. Whereabouts in terms of menopause are you now? And what have you found has managed your symptoms the best, particularly the memory lapses? I was a really early adopter of HRT. So I'm in my perimenopause. And I knew that at some point, the world was going to catch up with HRT and dementia. And, you know, I think HRT has been a godsend for me in, in the sense of I also had that overwhelming fatigue, like I was wading through treacle all the time. My memory, it's much sharper. The joint pains aren't there. I'm sleeping better, less anxiety. So, so I think, I think for me, you know, I, I knew that going just down the holistic route, you know, of supplements or of, of just, you know, thinking about exercise, considering how turbulent my life was at that particular time, I, I, I was going through an acrimonious breakup. So, you know, I, I knew that There was no way that I would be able to just do this holistically. And also knowing what my PMT was like, I couldn't have, you know, every week being like that. You know, I would have, you know, lost everything. You know, my family would have excommunicated me. My daughter would have, I don't know, run away from home. I'd have lost my job, you know, everything. Um, I, I just couldn't be like that. So for me, HRT was something that I had to, I felt, be part of my regime. I also thought, you know, there's a lot of, negative talk about HRT we also need to kind of demystify it and so that's another sort of passion of mine to give women you know the real information um, so they can make their own choices. How did you go about specialising going from being a GP to really digging deep into perimenopause and menopause? So so you can do um, advanced certification in menopause so that was one of the things I did you know sort of the theory side of things but I actually then went and spent a lot of, of time in different menopause clinics you know, in my own time, um, with sort of leading people in that field. So, you know, I I did um, sort of almost like two years of just sort of sitting in in clinics, you know, learning and finding my own way. So most of the menopause clinics within the NHS are run by gynaecologists, you know, not GPs, by gynaecologists, you know, and they have a very much more sort of black and white science type approach. And, And, you know, whilst I said I didn't want to be a GP, the the, the being a GP for that length of time has given me a lot of skills in the sense of looking at women or looking at people holistically. It's not just about looking at your ovaries. It's about looking at you as a person. And so I think you know, when I was sitting in with them, I was thinking I could do this better because all they're doing is talking about the ovaries. If somebody has IBS, they were like, go back to your GP. If they had so sort of acne or something, go back to your GP. Um, you know, and, and also the psychological element of it, you know, relationships, um, you know, women talking about their libido, their sexual health, um, all of that aspect, you know, listening to them. So I do think, you know, being a GP is actually, you know, sometimes life does things, you know, for, for certain reasons. And I think mm-hmm. it's got so many skills. And it also, when I was a GP, it allowed me to go off and do so many other different types of training. Like I went and I used to work in an alcohol rehab clinic. So I did advanced alcohol and addictions management. I, I very much am somebody who wants to tackle obesity, you know, very much a preventative health person. Um, So looking at weight management was part of, um, you know, a clinical trial there. So so being a GP allowed me to do that. But I sat in with many different doctors, sort of almost like picking the best I felt from each of them to kind of work out my way, my, my method. And where did you go from there? How did you find your method? Yeah, so I suppose that's been a little bit of a journey. Um, coming out of this acrimonious divorce, you know, sometimes when you've lost everything, you've got nothing to lose. Uh, so one of the clinics I used to work at, you know, sort of learning my skills, as it were, was at the top of Harley Street. And I'd always wanted to set up my own clinic. I had no idea where it would be. But, you know, it was a rainy day and I was walking up to that clinic a little bit grumpy because there was only one patient booked in. And um, and I thought, you know, by the time I get home, I'll have popped into Zara, eaten some lunch. Basically, I'll have made no money, you know, at all. Um, and there was a sign up for a floor to rent. It was a lower ground floor. And so I rang them up and I said, you know, I wanted to start my own clinic and could I rent it? And they said, come in the next day to have a conversation about it. So I went in the next day and I, I effectively pitched my vision. And 
I got it. In about 36, 48 hours, I'd gone from not having a clinic to having a clinic or, or you know, sort of agreeing um, that I was going to rent this. And there was a five month gap before the lease, the current um, people were going to move. So then, you know, I just set things into motion. The funny thing was, um, I was dating somebody at the time. And he said to me, Shazadi, do you have a business plan? And I went, mm, no, uh, no, no, I don't have a business plan. And he said, you know, how are you going to make this work? And uh, I said, I believe. I said, I believe in it. Um, and he's a, he, he has his own business and he's very much more sort of that business mind. And so there I was being, I believe, and, you know, people will come. I mean, fields of dreams almost, you know, that kind of, <laughs> kind of approach. And he said, look, no, you can't just do that. We need to sit down and do a business plan. And I said, I said, okay. And I thought it was really nice of him because we just started dating. And, and so, and, and we were actually on holiday. So we sat across the table eating our pasta in Sicily and um, we wrote a business plan on a napkin. Beautiful place to write a business plan. <laughs> Obviously transferred it to an Excel spreadsheet, you know, when I got back but <laughs> on, a, um, on a napkin. It's actually really romantic. I think that's lovely. Yeah, I thought so too. I thought, you know, even though it's a very practical thing, I thought this is lovely. This man wants to sort of help me without taking over. You know, that was something mm. I definitely did not want was somebody who took over and who t- took my power because I'd been in that scenario before. So, so yeah, so um, I, I did it for him. I allowed him to, you know, to, to, to write a, a, a business plan because it would help him sleep better. But it was, you know, very much, um, you know, something that was really helpful. Um, and, and really, that was it. So then after that, I was still sort of working some NHS, some in my own clinic. Some days I, it would only be one patient. Some days there would be no patients. But, you know, the thing is, I was I was persevering. And, you know, anybody who kind of asked me to write an article or do a podcast or do, you know, I'd say yes, you know, because the whole point was um, it was to get myself out there. I felt like I was this little gem in this in this clinic which people didn't know about and they needed to know about. So I needed to get the word out there. That's wonderful. And a really exciting feeling being right at the beginning of something. There is a difference between somebody taking over and somebody working with you. And I feel that for a lot of us at this time in our lives, we do get the opportunity to reinvent ourselves and do things for ourselves, not in a selfish way, in a more giving way. You mentioned changing the face of menopause and perimenopause. And I feel that your attitude to setting up your own clinic and doing it your own way is kind of the beginning of that. How else are you changing the face of menopause? Well, I think that is one of the things I wanted to sort of share with women. It's not the end of life. You know, midlife is not end of life. It can very much be that start. And, you know, I almost would say it's not about reinventing because I think actually what happens at this point is we as women become that woman that we want to, we've wanted to be. But in the past, you know, we've been maybe mothers or workplace or partners. And now, we actually become that person. It's coming out of that cocoon like a butterfly. And that's how I felt a a little bit, not like a phoenix rising, more like that butterfly coming out of the cocoon. So I think think how I wanted to change the face of menopause was one, I wanted to give it a bit of diversity because I really felt also that it did seem very white middle-class out there. And, you know, as I said earlier, menopause it, every woman goes through it you know also coming from my socioeconomic background you know, my father was a bus driver and I was the first to go to university so knowing that background you know I wanted to reach ev- every woman really so I think that that was one of the ways I wanted to change it give it a bit of diversity add a bit of spice to it I also <laughs> wanted to make it a bit more positive you know I wanted to make it positive I wanted to make it fun you know let's not just moan and groan there are solutions out there and I think I wanted to give women that hope that actually it, it can be a good time. You know, you can, you find your voice, you become that woman. It's not easy. Every day is not an A-star day. But, you know, sometimes you're know, understanding and, and also, you know, getting women to um, learn more about it. And for me, you know, social media has been a way for me to reach all of those women by giving little sort of educational snippets. There is a part of me that feels a sort of a guilt in having a private clinic because of my coming from where I came from. Um, But I also knew that if I'd stayed in the NHS as a woman in perimenopause, 
I would have burnt out and I couldn't have continued, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here with you. And so there is a time, you know, like I said, we are, we can now become the person we want to be. I didn't want to be a GP. You know, I wanted to be, you know, a specialist in my field. I wanted to be in charge of my own time and be in control, which I am now. So, so, you know, there were lots of factors for me not to work within the NHS and do, do what I do. But I think Instagram or social media, what it allows me to do is give information, you know, help other women who, who may not be able to afford um, an, an appointment in clinic. So, so that's also, you know, one of the things and one of the ways I wanted to sort of change the face of um, menopause and also to highlight perimenopause because, you know, I very much have that preventative health approach. I didn't want women to fall off that cliff of menopause and then feel that they've got to clamber back up because if we can address it sooner rather than later, you know, we can have a much more positive journey. Are there any overriding symptoms that women come to you? Anything that's really repetitive, I suppose? Yeah, it's not hot flushes. It is things like insomnia, anxiety, the brain fog, you know, those, those ones, those ones that maybe in the past we might not even considered, you know, to mm-hmm. be part of um, the, this, um, the menopause journey. So surprisingly, you know, that that is the, the mood aspect, you know, the flatness in mood, the anxiety, the insomnia, the lacklustre, that loss of energy, you know, and what commonly women say is, I just don't feel like me, you know, or I feel I've lost myself. Even, you know, the, the changes to their body, things like weight gain, they say, I j- just don't feel like I'm in my own body. I'm not in my own skin. And, and it's that that is the overriding thing that women say, I just don't feel like myself. So how do you help them once they've got to that stage? And second question, I suppose, would be preventative measures then. What can people do? Yeah. So, so when, when they come along, one is just to explain and, and, you know, help them understand what's going on. And I think, you know, because I have the time to do that and the time to listen, um, often, you know, when they walk out, they, they feel empowered, you know, they feel much more positive. So, so I listen, you know, we talk about what supplements they should be taking potentially, you know, what should be added into their regime. You know, I do talk to them about HRT, I weigh up the, the pros versus the cons for them. You know, overall, you know, for most women, I would say, you know, starting around that age, you know, in, the, in their 40s and early 50s, the benefits do, on the whole, outweigh the negatives. So we have this conversation because, you know, we women talk more about quality of life. I think we want to have more of a quality of life. So, so you know, they, they may walk away with an HRT prescription, um, which can often be that catalyst to do all of those preventative measures. You know, the things that your doctor's been telling you for years, Oh, stop smoking, you know, cut down your alcohol, go off and exercise. But, you know, there are certain types of exercise which work better for women around this age. We talk about resistance training, muscle strength, um, flexibility, also sort of um, impact because of osteoporosis prevention. It, it's a bit like being a, a life coach as well as a doctor and sort of combining the holistic and the medical um, to give them a plan. And I think what women like is to have a plan of action, um, something they don't have to think about because I've done it for them. And then we will just add to it. You know, all women, I mean, and I, I say this about myself, even if you are the most high flying woman and you're great at what you do, it's nice for somebody else to take charge of that for you and save save the hassle, the thinking. So I like to think uh, I save the hassle for them because I do that aspect for them. As the older sister, you're obviously not being teased for going through it first. <laughs> How are your sisters, your younger ones, doing? Oh, look, I, I've got I've got them onto HRT sooner rather than later. Again, because of my mother, um, I had to say to one of them, you, you know, you do seem a bit prickly. Um, and <laughs> because te- so that that's commonly what. So so you know, when I say women come in, they with their insomnia, their anxiety. The other thing is they have this prickly edge about them. And the second time they come in, it's, it's nice and smooth and it's a glow. Um, and I said this to my sister yesterday, actually, the, the one I said was a bit prickly. And I said, maybe you should try this. I said, I, you, you seem much calmer. Um, she said, do I? And the other thing is, often you don't realise it yourself because mm-hmm. you're just back to being you and other people around you don't notice it. So, so yes, yeah, so I'm very much about sort of, you know, sort of warning them or forewarning them sooner rather than later. Sometimes I find that they never want, people don't want to listen to the doctor in their family. They'll listen to somebody else. So you can only say so much. 
And how about your daughter? How old is your daughter currently? She's 23. So no, she's just graduated. You know, she still has to find her. I, I think she's kind of not sure what she wants to, to do. Um, but I think um, she now tells people, instead of saying my mum is a doctor, she says she's a social media influencer, which find, I find very kind of embarrassing because that's not my intention. And, you know, for all of those years of being a doctor, I'm now being the, the last two years of, you know, sort of building up um, a social media following to be told, um, to be telling her friends she's a social media influencer. You know, I, I, <laughs> it, it, um, yeah, so, so it's strange. I, I think mothers and daughters have quite a strange relationship. You know, they're, they're different relationships. One of the things she did say was, Mum, I don't think I could ever work as hard as you do. So I think that, um, you know, I think she's, she's learning to respect what I do and how I do it. And, uh, and maybe mum is good at what she does. I have been told that uh, they do grow to appreciate you. <laughs> it sounds like she respects you enormously and uh, that will grow. Your book, The Perimenopause Solution, can you tell us a bit about that? So The Perimenopause Solution, it was, like I said earlier, in the sense of trying to capture women sooner rather than later, forget for them to understand what's going on. But I wanted to write it, and I wrote it with Emma Bardwell, yeah, um, who's a nutritionist, because I wanted to look at all... You know, I wanted it to have a 360 feel to it. it. I didn't want it to sound sort of techie and clinical. You know, I think um, I think I'd like to think I'm not one of those types of doctors. You know, I think that I'm a woman first and then a doctor, and so I know what it feels like. So, so I think I wanted to write it in a way that it was, you know, sort of matter of fact, but it it, it ticked all these sort of information boxes, but in a way that you know women felt it was relatable. And so that's why, you know, we looked at the sort of the medical health side of things. We looked at the nutrition and we looked at the lifestyle side of things, because this is such an important time in our life um, when so many things can happen. You know, divorce rates are the highest, you know, suicide rates are the highest. So I think it's important to look at the psychological side of things, the mental health side of things. And, you know, we've had a challenging few years um, and we're having a challenging time now. So so I think I think and looking at how your mental health also impacts your physical health. So the perimenopause solution came out of just wanting to get information out there. It was, you, you know, in, in a way, you know, those books which are um, sort of a DIY for dummies or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I kind of wanted it to be a bit like that. But I thought I don't want to disrespect women by saying perimenopause for dummies. You know, and also, as I said earlier, I'm not a moaner and groaner. Well, I am, but I like to look, think about solutions as well. You know, and and so I think uh, enough whinging in some ways. You know, let's look at what we can do, what we can do, what we can do. So, so, so I think that's how the book came about. Um, I'm really pleased with it. You know, really pleased with it. Um, I, I would call it almost like a foundation book. You know, a core book that you can dip in, dip out. Um, obviously things are going to change maybe over the next few years but you've got that foundation book it's a bit like when I went to medical school we, we, we can always return to a book from like 50 years ago which has the core stuff in it and I'd like to think that this book will sort of stand the test of time I, I think it's a sexy book as well you know as, as looking at all the other covers and, and I, obviously I'm going to say this about our book you know it's it's a much more sexy cover and I think that it that that's because we as authors wanted to reflect that as well so um so yeah, I, I think it's a really nice coffee table book. You should just pop it down there and um, let people walk in and read it, you know, take it to the beach. I think that sounds fantastic. Yeah, coffee table, definitely. Before dinner parties, get people talking as well, which is kind of what we're trying to do here. As you mentioned that it is a sexy cover, sex drive for women, that often declines, sometimes rises. What is your best piece of advice for women experiencing difficulties in that area? Yeah, I mean, surprisingly, that's also one of the big things that women come in to talk to me about. You know, I feel like I'm a sex doctor some of the time, but I think it's just become <laughs> open, you know, and I think we mm. talk about it. I think I think there's, there's often a few stages to get your libido back. I think some of it is, you know, sort of getting that energy back. Because if you're not sleeping well, if you've not got energy, then you've got nothing really in the tank to give in that, that respect. Also, mm. you know, physical changes, weight gain, um, you know, it, it's, your skin and hair changes it, it it really affects your confidence um about who you are so in some ways you, you know you have to start loving yourself first and you have to make those steps to to be able to 
Um, I mean, some of that might be going on to HRT, some of it may be, you know, sort of going on to a weight management program, you know, things like that. But but I would say that, you know, it is something that you have to put a little bit of homework into or home play into because, you know, there's often a mind-body disconnect and we need to kind of reconnect it again. I often say, you know, I can give you lots of lotions and potions, but if you don't sort of go and practice at home, you know, mm-hmm. um, then, then you, you know, you're not going to go very far. And I often say, you know, it's a bit of a self-discovery. Um, there's no need to jump into couple play. You know, I, th- I, I would always say, get your confidence back on your own, you know, sort of look at your body, um, you know, have an orgasm on your own, um, you know, sort of reconnect um, before going off into couple play. So, so there is an element of you have to kind of reestablish that connection. In terms of changing public understanding, not just the women who are going through perimenopause and menopause, what can we do to normalise all of this? I think from the sort of grassroots, you know, sort of schools, you know, I think, I think, you know, so so that boys and girls know about it. It's just part of normal conversation. You know, one of my sisters um, has hot flushes and she went round to my brother's house and he's got a 12 year old and he kind of... She, she, she was having a flush and he, uh, and he sat her down and he fanned her and he went, is it menopause? And she went, yes. And, you know, and I just thought that's what it is. You know, he just said it in a normal way because I'm his auntie. So, so, so it's part of his sort of every day almost. So I think that's how it should be. You know, we should be, you know, and in workplaces, you know, because men also need to understand um, what's going on because, Often, you know, men can feel that they are rejected or, you know, you, you, you know that the relationship is so impacted that if they also have an understanding, oh, OK, you know, this is what's going on and how they can help in this process as well. So I think education all around workplaces, schools, making it part of the normal sort of science lessons, like we talk about pregnancy like, um, and in the workplaces, it should be like we talk about maternity, um, you know, it's just at the other end of reproductive life. So. So I think, you know, it, it needs to be given that space and uh, also that status. The ageing overnight that you mentioned earlier of some of your patients previously, is that due to their lack of self-confidence, do you feel, or is there something deeper? There's, you know, sort of chemical changes going on because uh, your oestrogen levels drop. Oestrogen is very important when it comes to collagen production. That's why you lose that density. So the aging process is there is um, sort of biochemical changes going on, physiological changes on because the drop in hormones, but also lack of sleep, you know, and also flatness in mood. I mean, if you think back when, you know, I'll think back when I've not been so happy, you know, when things are, life hasn't been so happy, you do look a little bit more dull, a bit more grey. You feel like there's, you know, the weight of the world's on your shoulders. Um, and then when you are happier, suddenly you feel, look 10 years younger, you've got, you, you look brighter, lighter. Um, and I see these changes in women when they come into clinic. Um, you know, often the first time they come in, I sort of want to cry with them because of their stories and that pain. Um, and then the second time they come in, I want to cry with them because it's so joyful, you know, to see how they have changed and it's lifted. And also hair thinning is a big symptom around this time. Um, and that is something that, that you know, really affects women. So, so I, I sometimes joke and laugh and say, women are putting up with hot flushes, night sweats, joint pains, but as soon as their hair starts to fall, that's when they'll make the appointment and they'll come in. One foundational piece of advice then. One piece of advice that I always say to women is, if you don't feel like yourself, then go and see somebody, go and talk to somebody about it. However young you think you are, it can happen sooner than you think. So if you don't feel like yourself, don't just put it down to you know life. Go and have a chat to somebody about it because there could be other things going on um, that could be addressed now to make you know so that you don't have to suffer in silence. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Harper. That's really useful advice for everybody. It's just been really lovely to to speak to you. Lovely to meet you as well. All right, bye. You too. Take care. The Perimenopause Solution by Dr. Shazadi Harper is out now and I highly recommend it. You can find her also on Instagram at the Harper Clinic and at Dr. Shazadi Harper, also known as the Perimenopause Doctor. I will leave all the spellings in the show notes so that you know where to find her. Remember to follow us on the podcast apps 
Subscribe to the newsletter and the podcasts, and please do continue to spread the word. The more this gets out, the more we can normalise perimenopause and menopause in everyday life for us and the generations that follow us. Thank you for listening. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Thank you.